Hey everybody, BTO Pro here. Today we are going to get performance obsessed, and I mean obsessed. So I recently was able to achieve uh, damn near 100 scores across the board uh, on Hack CMS running on a live server. Um, and so I want to kind of step backwards and go from how we went from like bad performance uh, to where we are given the constraints that we're placing on ourselves. Now, the reason you're seeing OpenWC here, which you can learn more about at, scroll that down, openwc.org, um, is basically just, you know, if you never adopt the crazy stuff that I'm about to show, please just go check the, check this out. The, the future is way brighter when we all adopt web components and, all, and micro, you know, frameworks of its ilk um, than all of these other libraries that we've been using since 2013. <coughs> cough, cough. All right. Anyway, so um, what we're going to talk about is performance and how we're achieving uh, just stupidly fast scores um, for what we're, what we're putting out. Um, so I'm going to hit refresh on this. You see it's going to load pretty fast. Um, this is hacksthewweb.org, which you see the address there, right? Hacksthewweb.org. Um, and this is running off of GitHub pages. Uh, now, we've made you know, some slight tweaks to the way that things work. And this isn't going to cover every performance technique that we use in order to, to achieve what is going on on this site. Um, but the reason I say what we're doing doesn't make a ton of sense and is, you know, still somehow stupid fast. Um, let's let you see the network inspect on Hacks the Web. We fire this up. I'm going to disable cache in this case so you can see. Look how many assets are being requested. <laughs> Hundreds, 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 hundreds. It's going to peak. No, oh, it doesn't peak a thousand. So there's 923 requests there, supposedly. Now, granted, part of this is related to, you know, YouTube is there. So let's go to a page that doesn't have YouTube. Just a blank. This is documentation, right? We'll refresh this page. Again, we see hundreds of assets showing up. And yet, even this site has some pretty decently uh, high scores. Now, they're not incredible. Um, however, you still see that DOM content loaded number is real low. And I, when I say real low, I mean relative to the fact that this just bootstrapped an entire content management system with all editing capabilities, ability to search around to things, ability to build, um, you know, build out a DOM tree at will. Um, it did all of this, loaded all these things in, in that short amount of time all these custom elements. There's hundreds of custom elements uh, definitions in here. And I mean hundreds, you know, probably north of 500. Um, and this is not the norm for the sites remaining, right? This is the hacks CMS and uh, coupled with hacks editor, the actual editing experience. So end users don't see this editing experience. They don't have to bootstrap all these tags and and have this leverage, but we're still able to achieve pretty darn high performance scores, even with this crazy amount of JavaScript coming in. So let's step into some of the ways that we do about doing that. Um, so if you want to learn more about Hacks CMS or, you know, play with the source, you can get it on, on GitHub. Um, it's under ElmsLN uh, slash Hacks CMS. Our whole ElmsLN repo has a ton of stuff for web component developers. So um, you know, there's our entire portfolio of, of web components, which are marked under the uh, LRN Web Components Mono Repo. Um, I did a count recently and found that we actually have 433 elements in our repo. Um, but um, that was a few, that was like a week or two ago. So now it's probably closer to 440 or 445. Um, point being, we're probably the leader in, in amount of openly available web components that exist at this point. Um, so we have an insane amount of the overall number of web components that exist, even higher than the number that's expressed uh, on webcomponents.org. If you actually go and search, right, you can see, hey, things by Elmsalen. You see there's 169. I used to use that number, but that's 169 repos. Um, some of these elements, like Lunar Search, Simple blog. Simple blog has like 20 elements in it. Um, so, yeah. So, we have a lot of elements, and yet I had to post this issue recently. So, this is a force a resize event one second after paint. Um, let's go to our test.
page in question here. So the reason I had to post that issue is, um, let's hit refresh. Yeah, that was dumb. That was dumb fast right there. Uh, I have to resize the page slightly in order to get this element to show. Um, and the reason why is because this is loading the asset so fast that it's actually missing the initial event firing um, that's supposed to take place to make this, this display. Um, so this is a stupid, stupid amount of, of speed. I actually have iron list in this case, which is what's doing this, which needs to know the height of the document. It's missing the timing because it's loading so fast um, as far as knowing how tall it is. <laughs> so um, let's go, let's look at what some of our constraints are. This is another hack CMS uh, microsite. You're actually probably watching this video as a result of this blog. So this is the blog post. I'm taking a picture of it prior to uh, actually putting the video into it. But so these are the scores on that page. And I, I, I keep obscuring the address. I'm not showing you the address bar because uh, where these live in production has not been publicly announced. And we are seeding that out uh, internally at Penn State um, to just a, a couple people. We wanna really make sure this thing is, is rock solid uh, usability and, and performance and everything. Uh, but effectively, we, we've been working on a, um, a SaaS version of HackCMS that we call Haxium. So the Haxium platform um, is effectively a um, integration with single sign-on systems and enterprise logins, if you will, um, the wiring to be able to do that for HackCMS. Uh, so that a person, you know, at your institution or a company or whatever would log in and they would get their own hack CMS uh, microsite manager, not the site itself, right? This is a site produced with hack CMS. I'm talking about the management console that lives above this. So if we want to see what that is real quick, just for state of being, uh, we can see that I can generate a site. Uh, we're going to say that this is using a slide deck, sure, why not? And it's purple, create a site. And I'm going to go to that site now, and there we go. So here's the hacks editor running at a domain that I am not currently showing you um, because I don't want people to, to jump in and start adopting it before we're good to go. But um, I'll tell you, it's not, it's not running on Drupal. Um, and it's not at a domain associated with Drupal. So anyway, um, that is the that console, right? This screen here, this is what I'm talking about as far as uh, what Haxium provides. Um, that, you know, uni universal login, and then I can just sit here and stamp out sites and, you know, select them and say, hey, publish them or archive or whatever. So we're working on that right now. So how do we get performance scores that allow me to make ridiculous claims like, I was able to produce 50,000 hack CMS instances in 80 seconds. Um, again, not sites, instances. And then that those sites are able to produce output that gets these scores, right? So you probably wanted that part to begin with. So you could skip ahead past the first eight minutes, I guess. I'll put a note about that. But so here's the criteria of, um, you know, kind of the constraints we place ourselves under because a lot of people don't understand what the hell we're doing in general, let alone specifically with the way we're crafting web components. So um, by design, we do not bundle our assets. Um, we believe in the ES6 uh, JavaScript module standard, which is on can I use very high, right? This is JavaScript modules. You see everybody supports this now uh, with the exception of IE. Um, and another by design, um, speaking of IE, Things that are outside of ES6 at this point, right? So ES5 capable platforms like IE, um, we do not ship this user experience to that you're seeing here. We ship a site that does still have the content. Uh, it basically is treating it like it's no JavaScript. So Hack CMS is able to target everything back to the beginning of time with the exception of there's like IE6 and 7 don't work for no reason, but I don't really care about those. Um, but you know, even back to like Safari 1 or Firefox 1, uh, you could load this site in Netscape Navigator and you'll still get content. You'll still get the content of the article. You're not gonna get all the enhancements, the custom elements, right? But you'll still get a navigation structure. So because of that design paradigm, because like, like IE11 is going away. So we don't, really don't need to keep limping it along. 
um, uh, users must click through UI and build uh, what you know some would call a CMS, what I did before, right? Where I just clicked a button and that actually built a new uh, uh, PWA. That site needs to not have any developer intervention, needs to hit darn near 100 page speed scores, zero config. Uh, we're talking zero configuration. All of this, you know, the CMS is orchestrating and stamping out high quality PWAs. Um, we will do zero server-side rendering. Um, I, I've been a stickler about this, but uh, server-side rendering is complex to set up. And again, if we're trying to eliminate developers from what is causing people to not be able to uh, self, you know, express themselves online, which is kind of the point of Hack CML is um, to unlock self-expression and self-publishing for everyone, uh, primarily educators with you know online course materials, but anyone really. I mean, this site is also me expressing myself. Um, and also to that end, uh, all decisions made must ensure Hack CMS microsites can run with or without hacks, with or without a dynamic backend, um, so that they are fully decentralizable. I need to be able to copy and paste the folder structure or zip it up and send it to someone, and they should be able to paste it into um, the Hack CMS sites directory and then navigate to it in their Hack CMS instance, whether that's on our eventual desktop app, whether that's um, on a server running locally, whether that's on a, a SaaS solution, whatever it is, that has to run zero config, no setup, no understanding of you know database migrations or whatever, and it has to just drop in and then Hack CMS, if the system is there, will look at that microsite and go, oh, I can give you an editing experience because there's a backend. That has to happen if we are to ever ensure the content permanence of what we're doing. So all of these sites, I want to run to the end of time. Uh, as a result, I, I saw a tweet the other day, it was about DOM. Um, you know, hey, sites that were built using the DOM as a target 20 years ago somehow still work. Yeah, that is, that's what we're going for. We're going for permanence, and that is what the Web Components Standard uh, will net us. So we don't bundle our assets, uh, which means that we can ship all kind of different themes, all kind of different configurations, allow people to self-construct with the pages and dynamically load the assets. So those are our constraints, but yet somehow <laughs> we're able to get absurd scores. So let's, let's see how, how we're doing that. Um, the first part is uh, around the imports part of the specification and how we actually get stuff to the browser. So let's look at that JS modules, right? So you can use script type module uh, in everything modern. I'll show how we're supporting those older ones too. Um, and then the more important for performance uh, standpoint in this area even is uh, dynamic imports. Now dynamic imports just landed in Firefox. You can see they're gonna land in the, you know, the next version of Edge. That's kind of cheating because it's, you know, Chrome, but, um, but dynamic imports are huge for the methodology that we use to set this thing up. The reason is, let's take this import definition up here. So if we look at a, uh, a page and we view the source on it, so this is btopro.com and, and the source of these are all generally the same. Um, so if we go all the way to the bottom, we'll see that there is script type module, which is a new way of defining JavaScript. It says, hey, load this in modularly and then resolve all the pieces. So what this is doing is it's looking uh, for a build file. And so, so I'm gonna show you what's in that build file. Um, that build file might have other imports. And so what JS modules and the, and the import uh, you know, statement does is it, JavaScript will go through and says, oh, these are modular, so I need to trace this. So it's going to, as the page is setting up, it's gonna hit this block. Uh, it's gonna go, oh, import this. And then it's not gonna keep moving forward. It's not going to you know, run that JavaScript and then be like, oh, here's the page for you end user. It's gonna go into here and find this. And then it's gonna go into the next file and the next file and the next file. And it has to build the entire tree. That's why it's modular. And so that can be seen as a negative potentially for performance, right? I have. 400 files, let's say, that are referenced because this is unbundled. We're not doing tree shaking. Um, it's unbundled. Why would I be able to get high performance scores? Well, because of HTTP2. HTTP2 allows for assets to 
get streamed as wide as the pipe will allow. And so those assets start piling in really fast if you have HTTP2 on. So you have to have HTTP2 configured. Um, we have this in Haxium, we have like, here's these four commands you run on, on Ubuntu uh, 18 to get this, this up and going. But the next issue is around the, you know, import versus dynamic import. So a dynamic import is interesting in the way that the browser handles it because if, let's say we've got all these elements and they're all referencing each other, right? And these, you know, when they're running in production, that'll say you like dot, dot, slash node modules or whatever. Um, those all have to resolve as a whole tree because JavaScript has been told via this import statement, hey, you got to import everybody so I know what the heck the structure of this is and then I can evaluate the whole thing. However, dynamic imports do not have that as a criteria. So what you can do is if you can find the minimum critical path to ship the experience to start to un, you know, unfold for the user, you can use dynamic imports to pull all the other functionality in on the fly and it won't block the render tree. This is really critical. So in this case, in the hacks editor itself, which is what this is, this H-A-X tag, it is only requiring hacks store now the store is really important, right? That's you know if you're if you're used to MobX or, or Redux or any of that, right? I we have our own store, and that store makes sure everything works together nicely. Uh, it's the state management for just this concept, so that needs to be there, right? That's it's going to get screwed up if it's not. So okay, that's critical path. We're going to reference the store. However, all the pieces that actually make the editor work can be dynamically imported. And so what this will do is, you know, it's going to effectively kick all of these off as independent threads. It's why when you go to you know, like btopro.com, you see that, right? That, that you know, flash of unstyled content, if you will, almost, where things just kind of fizzle into, into, into place. That's because, and you see it much more dramatically here, right? Like, that shouldn't happen with JS modules traditionally, because if I had all of them as required to block the tree, it's going to wait on that initial screen for a pretty long time, and then you'll see it show up, right? So we have a longer, you know, time till the entire DOM is constructed and everything's ready to go, but because we're able to break that up into all these other little threads where you think, 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 right? Um, one, you give the user the perception that something's happening, which is really important, especially if you're trying to get an initial paint, right? You, you're worried about person types in the URL, taps a link or whatever. Yeah, they've got to see something's happening or they'll be like, well, maybe this doesn't work or maybe I'm not going to wait around for whatever it is, right? So it has to be fast. That content has to show up quickly. It has to be and go, oh, well, there's a menu, right? So you can figure out what's involved in, in the critical the critical tree, right? If I have this and that, that menu is closed, right? The content on mobile is super important. This menu loading after the fact, less important, right? I need to deliver the user that first content. And so dynamic imports help us do this. Um, now, in this case, you can see I'm doing it in the constructor, right? So this is still pretty important uh, to this whole element working. And so the life cycles in web components uh, and this is a vanilla custom element, by the way. So uh, is constructor and then connected callback and then there's like disconnected callback um, at, at the end. Um, in this instance, I'm taking the constructor and just saying like, hey, let's, we do need these, they're important, but let's just make sure that the render tree is not blocked, right? Um, what I could also do, and this, um, I talked about this with a couple people on, on Twitter and the Polymer Slack channel, um, I could take these dynamic imports and shift them up to here. And so what this would then do from a performance perspective and a timing perspective is, you know, the definition for hacks is in the critical path. It gets traced and placed on the DOM. Then, or sorry, the, the definition is loaded, I should say. And then these start to kick off additional threads to start to load. Then when the tag is actually connected to the DOM, and again, this is minor timing difference, then all of these would show up. Um, you could also delay these even in longer. Um, you start to get into some things that are a little more, well, way more polymer specific. But if I go into, um, uh, I think HAL 9000 might have that. Let me see. Um, 
Oh, I don't have that in Hell 9000, but I, I do have some other things. Oh, I thought I had other things dynamically importing Hell 9000, I guess not. Um, let's look in one of the, there's a, there's a function in Polymer, I'm looking for its, uh, ah, there it is, after next render. So after next render, there we go, um, in the Polymer documentation is useful for, you know, basically saying like, hey, all of the connected callbacks have fired. And so now let's do these other things. So um, in this case, I'm using it to apply like event listeners because that doesn't have to happen prior to everything else. Um, that's another thing we do is I, I heavily delay uh, event listeners from being attached unless they're critical to the, you know, the path. If it's a user interacting with something, in my mind, that's not critical to the path. We're talking about how do we shave off milliseconds at scale, right? I've got 400 ZM elements. How do we shave off a millisecond per element or whatever so that we can get up to, um, you know, in that case, 400 milliseconds that I could shave off by just tweaking one technique? Well, maybe that's adding event listeners late that involve user interaction, like focusing or tapping on things or what have you. Um, so if you're using Polymer, which we, we use a mix of lit element, polymer, and vanilla, um, then that's something that you can use you know, in render status to, to get access to that. Uh, but you'll see I also do dynamic imports early on in the constructor of that item. Um, I'm looking for a after next render where I do a dynamic import. I don't, I don't appear to have any right in here, but um, we'll, we'll do that as well. We'll say, well, you know what? This is not super important. So let's like just... You know, the user's not going to interact with this. Um, I think a decent decent example of that uh, would be in our UI elements of the uh, of Hack CMS. Um, I think search works this way. Uh, or maybe it's what search implements. So search pulls in lunar search. And lunar search. Okay, there's building a path. Import. Oh, I don't have a dynamic import in Lunar Search. My bad. Um, but we we do that on certain elements as well. Um, oh, multiple choice has it. Um, where you know, based on the settings the user has provided, which you can get access to in connected callback, then we'll do additional dynamic imports. Right. The whole point of the dynamic import is, as long as it's not an actual dependency for this file to operate, um, then you're it's worth delaying. Right, so in the case of uh, like hack store, you can see that we have dynamic imports. Ah, there's a good, there's an example. Um, hacks has uh, voice commands. Now we haven't fully implemented them. I haven't talked about it much because I want it to be bulletproof before we do it. But um, in the near future, you'll be able to be like uh, search YouTube and it'll you know pop up the right thing, and then you can speak and it'll fill in the field, then you could say insert as video or something. Um, so to do that, we use a library called Anyang, and Anyang uh, operates off of HAL 9000. It's a, it's a web component made that's just for brokering voice-based communication calls. That is hyper-specific. Why would that block the render tree? And so what we, the way that we can you know, cheat on timing, right, is um, we do our dynamic imports for the things that are still important and should happen early. And then everything that is actually required for this to do anything meaningful still gets in here as an import. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, um, if it's a component that lives as an element in your DOM, I am dynamically importing it. Um, you see there's an exception there with uh, Iron Ajax and like Simple Toast in this case. Um, so I do make exceptions to that, but like, you know, if it's a card um, that's here, a lot of times I'm going to dynamic import the reference for that card as opposed to make it a render blocking type of a thing. And again, render blocking is the whole tree of those JS modules has to be assembled. And so if you can fragment those as much as possible, you can cheat on the timing to get the DOM to stand up. Um, if you do multiple dynamic import calls, it's the, the browser is smart enough to go, oh, I already have that. Right, so it'll still dedupe everything correctly. Um, another thing uh, that we do is because I, I mentioned we use Polymer and we use Polymer unbundled, is um, we don't minify the JavaScript uh, of our bundles and we don't bundle them. Right, so I actually have in builds here. I have an ES6 build 
uh, which is non-minified JavaScript. Then I have an ES6 AMD. That's for like modern uh, Firefox and modern Safari that didn't support dynamic imports. It's, a, um, it's kind of a, or sorry, also um, Edge for that matter. Um, it's a small sliver of your browser traffic, but it does still exist. And, and you should, as much as possible, serve ES6 uh, code to, use, to browsers that can support ES6. So that's what that build is. You can see, to accommodate the non-dynamic import, I have transform modules to AMD. Um, then ES5 AMD, which is for some legacy, some other projects where we actually use that, because we use one build routine for everything. I do minify. Now, the reason for that, and this is a more, much more recent change, uh, in order to hit that 100 score, is um, I use Polymer to keep everything unbundled, and you know it, it does a good job of deduping stuff. Um, but then, uh, in my package JSON for when I run a build routine, you see I do Polymer build, and then I have yarn run terser. So we actually have a gulp routine that runs afterwards, which runs gulp terser. Gulp terser spiders through the built assets um, does some, you know, some setting like, hey, compress stuff, keep it as modules, don't mangle all the names, and make sure the function names are, are the integrity of those is kept. And so what that does is it gets you an additional layer of compression and cleanup um, uh, beyond even what Polymer's build routine will do. And so we apply that to all the ES6 and the ES6 AMD assets so that they are mathematically as small as possible while still remaining unbundled. Again, because part of our criteria is to keep these unbundled. Um, so uh, that is how we're able to get this small as possible, you know, compressed assets that we have, but yet keep them all as discrete pieces. Um, the dynamic import tree ensures that we get these kind of, you know, fragmented uh, uh, trees that will emerge as far as setting it up. The next thing, and this is more, more recent, so we, um, I did a lot of research on HTTP2 push, and I was really excited about push. Push is basically that you can add headers um, to, on the server side and say, hey, I'm sending you an index, but you're also gonna need this image and this uh, JavaScript file, so why don't you just start getting those two? And so it allows you to skip on having to parse on, on the browser, parsing the DOM to discover the assets to make the calls. So I found a lot of articles that were really jazzed about this um, around like 2015, 2016. And then by 2017, a lot of articles that were like, yeah, this doesn't really, it's not really living up to the hype. Um, and the reason is just because of some of the, the ways that like the differences between Apache and Nginx and um, the differences between the way that the, the browser vendors have implemented that feature relative to the actual like uh, the way that it asks for items. Um, so I've decided not to use HTTP2 push, um, but I've got something even better than that. So another reason not to use HTTP2 push based on our criteria is um, trying to maintain speed without this side, right? So while setting headers in Apache is not server-side rendering, it is starting to couple some of that performance gain to the back end needlessly. And here's why I say needlessly. You can achieve the same effect on the front end um, through a different method, through a special type of link tag. So let's look at what btopro.com has here. So btopro.com, I'm, I'm the DOM, I'm being parsed right now. This document has been sent to you. Let's ignore this part, because then I'll go over what that does. So um, I, I'm reading the DOM, I'm saying, hey, there's a base. Okay, there has to be a base tag set for, for progressive web apps to work correctly. There's a manifest, good. I know I, I can be a progressive web app. Going down, going down, going down. This is something specific to work on GitHub um, with, with um, single, uh, single page apps. Um, then service worker script, right? Because I want my service worker early. Uh, we use a service worker to ensure that all of our assets are, you know, happily cached. This is something we pulled from the way Polymer does its progressive web apps. Um, so service worker runs. Step down through here. Um, you can see that it even will dispatch an event to show a message like, "Hey, the site has updated. You should load content." Um, that's you know after everything has been resolved. So. 
parses that stuff. Then it's going to parse the styles, and there's very few. But the styles are basically just so that um, you get that red, you see that red flash. It's actually hard for me to even have happen. <laughs> it happens so fast. Um, there we go, that, the hacks loading page. So to get that CSS styling, we read down through these very minimal styles. Um, another thing you can do to cheat on uh, impression of, you know, setup or time to first paint is, and this doesn't work in all browsers, but um, it should work in, I think it'll work in all the ES6 browsers. I haven't actually searched for that to find. Uh, da, 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 da. There's a pseudo selector. I don't see it there. Um, there's a pseudo selector um, available to CSS called defined. And defined uh, is really useful with custom elements because it's saying, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, if this tag is not defined, then style the thing inside of it. And so that's important when you're getting that first paint because if the tag isn't defined, right, because I'm, I'm lazy loading my assets, I don't know when this tag's definition is gonna arrive. Now, honestly, we might be splitting hairs over like 400 milliseconds where this definition isn't there. But that still might be enough of a reason to um, make sure the experience isn't jarring for the end user. I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say when I have this site here, let's say that this side area, um, or, or actually even better, this modal, if I, if I click on uh, a button to, to pop up a modal or something, there, like that, right? Let's delete the page. Let's say for some reason that that is um, in the render block to have a, a modal. If the definition for that modal isn't there, this content might just be printed on the DOM, and that'll give you a real nasty flash of unstyled content. Um, similarly, I'll use that defined technique inside of our other elements. So when I know I'm dynamically importing something, I'll do this not defined to ensure that it just says display none. And then it's a real nice uh, degradation on modern browsers to just, once it's defined, the display none goes away. Um, so it's a little, a little cheat, you know, if, if it's really important uh, to get to get that critical paint. So uh, we also throw in a Node.js flag. So if Node.js is attached to body, then hide the site building tag, uh, which is setting up the interface. Then you'll see we have an attribute, Node.js, and then we have the site builder, which has the words BTO Pro and loading in it. Then we've got uh, fallback again to our criteria for setting this up. So the legacy player um, is an alternate version of the interface that runs just for um, some older versions of Edge and Firefox, I believe. Um, even older than the ES, um, the pure ES6 ones. That, uh, so this is stuff that didn't natively support custom elements. Um, we have a special like, hey, show it this way. Now you're talking again, like I'm starting to account for things that are like under a half a percent, um, probably under two per, under two tenths of a percent to be perfectly honest of your traffic. But accounting for all those two tenths really adds up. So uh, then we have an even older, right? So this is stuff that doesn't work with, with custom elements at all. This is, I am quantifying as uh, you know, IE 11 and lower um, because I'm not gonna support it if it doesn't support ES6. So then that comes in. Again, we're, we're discussing render blog. How is the DOM being parsed when it gets out the other side? So then we're gonna hit script and the browser is gonna go, oh, well, let's remove that JavaScript flag, right? So that way we don't see that. Another cool thing with this, if you don't have JavaScript on, you do still actually get the site. <laughs> um, it's a watered down version of the site, but you will get the site, right? So here's, here's the links in this just static HTML and you can click and go to articles. So even if you don't have JavaScript, I need this, I, I want to support what you're doing. So um, then, we have uh, a CDN that's defined, and then we have two flags. We have an old and a ancient. <laughs> um, and we also have a, a context variable to say like, hey, this is a published version of the site. So an interesting thing you can do, and this, now this block, I'm gonna explain here uh, in part, I'm not gonna explain all this babble garbage, but uh, this is how we're able to do what people were previously doing as server side rendering. We can do it on the client side and deliver you the right copy. So you can use dynamic import as a test to see whether or not um, this is a full-fledged ES6 capable browser. So if dynamic import is supported, right, and this is, at, as of me speaking, uh, this whole block 
is going to be successful with, you know, like 80, 85 to 89 percent browsing traffic globally or something, right? This is going to get pretty high um, as far as ES6. We can really adopt ES, ES6 natively. It's pretty awesome. So let's say, let's not skip that for now. Let's say it was an error, right? It's IE11. It's Firefox as of uh, a version ago. It's, um, it's Edge as of two versions ago, something like that. Okay, so it doesn't support dynamic imports. All right, shoot. So um, we fall down in here and we go, okay, first, let's see, does it support symbol? Symbol is a way of saying, is this IE11 or older? Like a super ancient thing. Um, then we can also do an, we do an additional check of like, uh, okay, so you're, you're IE11 or older, but are you actually IE? If you're IE, we do ship you the definitions for the web components in ES5. Um, the reason I do that is because we are going to support IE11 being able to view the web components in the watered down version of the site. Uh, we haven't fully implemented that yet, but so what we then do is we say, okay, well, you need web animation next light polyfill. You need a promise polyfill and you need fetch uh, as a polyfill. Then we've got um, some Babel definitions. So just making sure all of this, you know, is happy. Um, which is what all that is there. It's just kind of some lightweight Babel polyfills for um, ES5. Um, then we ship you the full on Web Components bundle. And Web Components JS Web Components bundle is the full polyfill because IE11 needs every aspect of the polyfill. If you get here by some misfortune, uh, we send, hey, you're ancient. This is super old. Okay, let's hold on to that. Let's say that we pass the symbol test. So we are not IE11. We're not ancient, but we don't have dynamic imports, right? So this is like your, um, I believe, like Safari 9 would, would satisfy uh, this criteria, as would uh, Firefox uh, a version ago, Edge a version ago, um, things like that. So you're modern-ish, but you don't support dynamic imports. So we ship you, um, again, some, some polyfill code and web animations light, but now it's an ES6 AMD build routine. Then we ship you some more Babel, and then we make this evaluation. So we say, do you support custom elements? And this was a, another weird one. There are some of these browsers that support custom element spec, but don't support dynamic imports. Okay. So in those instances, we need to ship you um, the web components loader Web Components Loader will figure out what parts of the spec to polyfill. So it's a lower payload than the Web Components Bundle. Um, then we ship you our build routine. Okay, let's say you don't have custom elements, right? So right here, we're talking about um, Edge. Uh, a couple versions ago, Edge. Actually, I don't think custom elements have fully landed in Edge. No, I, I don't even know anymore because this stuff just works. So um, in that case, we're going to hide the super old version of the site and we're gonna hide the newish version of the site and we're gonna send you a legacy version of the site. We're also gonna send you fetch uh, and promise polyfills and the full on bundle just to not have to worry about it. And now this is a bizarre one, but I just discovered this and rooted this out today. Then we need to account for Safari 9. <laughs> Safari 9 passes a bunch of the tests above but yet doesn't have the ability to use let from ES6. So it passes the ES6 smell test, but yet isn't ES6. I don't know how it managed that. So we try to run this function. This is a convention that, um, that uh, you, as I learned. Um, if you do this new function, you can put code that isn't syntactically correct inside of here without breaking the entire JS tree as being uh, uh, syntactically wrong. So this is a test at last minute to say like, do they support let? Because if they, if they don't support let, they're not actually ES6 and yet we were about to serve them ES6 code. Um, so in that case, you're ancient or you've been served the ES6 AMD bundle at that step. Then ancient, okay, so you are ancient. Who the hell knows why you're viewing our site? Your browser's insecure. Most browse, you know, most sysadmins have blocked your traffic but still, I'll, I'll humor you. Uh, we hide the site, we hide the super old, or we show the super old fallback of the site because it was hidden above potentially. 
and then we uh, attempt to set content of an iframe to be the page that you're going to in the route. Uh, regardless, if you're in here, we say old is true. Okay. So that's a long-winded way of saying this is how we don't have to do server-side rendering. And this won't have to change. Like once you hit all targets with this stuff, it won't have to change. Users will keep falling forward to bypass this entire thing. But it's important to be able to hit those 100%. Okay. Then uh, I attach a link, actually two links, to um, the head of the document. The reason I do this is so that they're not render blocking. This is CSS. We load these late then as a result. Then, and this is not something you're going to see looked upon favorably in most places. A lot of browsers now, modern browsers, are preventing this from even running, which is totally fine. If whatever this is is old, then do a document.write. And document.write is a big no-no. However, this used to be a convention used when you were doing things old school. And so in these tests, if you came up as old, then we know we need to write this. Uh, it's as simple as that. Your browser supports write and it's old and should write. So what that'll do is it'll comment out dynamically these things. This is what 80, you know, five plus, you know, percent, whatever that is. I don't know what that percent is right now. Um, we'll say 80 to be safe. 80% of your browsing traffic skips all of that test logic and goes right here. And it loads the block, tree blocking, hey, give me the build and load everything. And then it dynamically imports you know, customizations uh, so that that's not tree blocking. Then it asynchronously loads web animations next light, which I, I use to polyfill uh, the web animations um, proposal, which hasn't landed like anywhere yet. Okay, that was a mouthful. And you say, wow, the whole DOM has to be parsed for this. This is guaranteed to be slow, Brian. Why would you do all this logic on the front end? You mentioned HTTP2 push before. What the hell happened to that? So the reason I skipped that initial part of the document is this, for the vast majority of your traffic, these three files, and actually these two CSS files, so these five files, are the critical piece of this document. They are the thing that 80, you know, 80 to 85% of your browsing traffic is going to want, and you know this. So, without doing HTTP2 push, you can do link rel preloads. And if we link rel preload those five assets, the entire conversation that I just hashed out in the last like eight minutes as to what the DOM is doing doesn't need to happen in order to ship you the assets. So in those, you know, again, that, that could be several hundred milliseconds of the DOM parsing. And I, I'll tell you, it's really not when I show you what the data is. But um, let's say it's 200 milliseconds. 200 milliseconds are shaved off in just not not getting the assets, in knowing to get the assets. So you are being robbed of, you know, 200, and this is, again, this is on like a really fast connection here I'm talking. Um, you could be being robbed of seconds on a slow connection because, and on an older browser, because of how slow those things are in parsing this information. When realistically, the vast majority of your users are going to need these, but the browser doesn't know that until it gets there. So if you do a link rel preload, and then you pass it the address and you tell it what the type is. So in this case, as. So this is saying, load this file as script and this cross origin anonymous thing is a little weird, but you do need to, to do it. You can read up on the spec associated with uh, link rel preload. Um, it is gonna skip ahead. Another thing you can do is you can pre-connect. And so this, this starts to broker the, um, the, the DNS connection settings. Uh, it's useful in, in, in working with CDNs. And so it basically just the browser said, is told, hey, you're going to start to get assets from here, so you better just make sure the DNS is connected ahead of time. Uh, again, that, that's something that might shave off, you know, I don't even know. It might be two milliseconds, it might be 50, whatever it is. Um, so then we preload, and again, then order becomes important here. I'm saying preload the build file, then preload the custom file. And again, these then just are shipping out to make requests. Then, and this is one that really sped things up for us, preload the file that's the direct reference of this file. 
And so I do that because when you preload this file, it's not operating in JS modules, so it's not going to dedupe the entire tree uh, in that instance. It's just getting that one file so that when it gets to the bottom to do the JS modules build, it goes, oh, I already have this, and it just processes it. Similarly, if you skip ahead to Haxiema Site Builder, I can get you the definition for that that much faster so that then when the DOM has processed to know it needs the definition, it starts to unpack everything. Then I ship you um, any custom elements you might have roped in, uh, which is very rare with what we're doing, and then I ship you the CSS after that. Uh, I then, similar to the pre-connect before, pre-connect a few origins that I know we commonly use uh, so that then when you need to get stuff from them, right, like Google font API, right, if we use one of the Google fonts off a of CDN, if you pre-connect that origin, you're going to get it that much faster when it's actually required. Okay. All of this happens automatically with Hack CMS, and that is why I can reload this page, and it's so fast that you can't even see what the link is that you can click on. So I can go this and just hammer it. This is on a live running server with HTTP2. This is why when I run Lighthouse, and I clicked Lighthouse, that I see scores like this. This is hitting a 99% performance score. Even though if I were to show you the assets, it is unbundled and you're getting, you know, 100 some odd assets there. Um, this is stupid fast, and you can do it to any site, um, as, as proven here, <laughs> with web components and doing them unbundled. The reason that I also recommend doing them unbundled is, um, let's say you have multiple applications or that you should throw these up on a CDN. If they're unbundled, then you're actually getting better performance for the user overall. So our methodologies are, are better for captive audiences, are better for networks of solutions, right? So if your company has like 50 sites and they're delivering 50 unique apps that you leverage the same subset of elements, right? Whether that's 20 or 100 or whatever, once a user of things in your properties has gone to one of those assets, now they've got that cached uh, from the CDN. So then additional sites will all start to load faster. Um, so if you have any questions about this, if you have criticism of, um, you know, what I'm saying or, or want to correct me on one of these things, maybe, maybe some of these performance techniques I mentioned are not actually accurate. Um, please feel free to hit me up on BTO pro on Twitter or hang out on uh, the polymer Slack channel. Um, but yeah, uh, please go and check out hackstheweb.org, see what we're doing with hack CMS. Um, and realize we are, we're a bunch of performance obsessed crazy people um, that are going to hack the way the web used to work. Have a good weekend.